Laws. Now let us note briefly some of the laws which Jesus gave for the benefit of mankind. The law of humility. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. In metaphysics, we refer to this law as the law of the reverse effort, which means simply that we receive the exact opposite of what we ask when our relation to the law is wrong. If we are related to the law negatively, then regardless of what we ask, the results will be negative. If we are related to the law positively, then the results will be positive. Jesus believed that if you keep yourself out of the pictures, others will put you in the picture if you should be there. If you keep yourself out of your consciousness, then God will fit it in with his presence. The reason humility is so important in spiritual work is because it opens the valve toward God, so that his blessings can flow in. The meek man is like a magnet, drawing everything and everybody to himself. Having emptied himself of himself, he is open to God. The proud or self-sufficient, on the other hand, is just the opposite of the meek. He does not attract people and blessings, but repels them. Being so full of his own opinions and egotism, he has no room for anything else. He crowds out the better things by his preoccupation with the lesser. The Law of Retribution With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. This law means that what we give out comes back to us. When we are generous, we receive generously in return. When we are kind, others are kind to us. When we are fearful, we attract trouble. When we are ugly, we bring out ugliness from others. When we are critical, we draw criticism from others. Now read this text again, and you will see that it is Jesus' way of telling you that your happiness and achievement depends not upon people, circumstance, or situations, but upon yourself. Your life is in your own hand to do with it as you please. It will be what you make of it. It will give back to you exactly what you put into it, no more, no less. But let us analyze this law from the other end. Let us suppose that you are the recipient instead of the sender of some injustice. Let us suppose that someone has willfully injured you. What are you to do? The answer is nothing. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. This is the law of the boomerang, the law of action and reaction. It is nature's way of fighting our battles for us, just as a rubber ball will return to us with the same force with which it is thrown against the wall. So the evil sent out by us will return to us. It will return in spite of anything we can do to stop it. The judgment precedes the act, thus relieving you of all retaliation and getting even. The Law of Sacrifice he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. A man's consciousness is like a stream of flowing water. If the stream is damned by self, the water settles in all the low places and becomes sour and inactive. The quickest way to purify and reclaim that low place in consciousness is not only to let in the Christ from above, but to open the dam or remove the self below. Many people try and demonstrate God in their affairs by repeating affirmations of truth, but they fail to let go of self and the blessings cannot go through. To surrender self, on the other hand, creates a spiritual vacuum that draws more blessing to fill the vacant place. Rich living is but the return circuit of a detached self. What we give away we keep, whether it be self, money, or anything else. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Withhold, and you shall lose. The self-centered consciousness is like a magnet for evil. It not only will draw disease and much sickness into its life and trouble into its surrounding, but eventually will go to pieces spiritually, mentally, and physically. Shutting itself within itself, it closes itself off from God and from others. Dr. Fritz Kunkel said, It has been shown that all mistakes, weaknesses, and aberrations can be traced back to man's egocentricity. Accordingly, the fundamental problems of self-education may be described as the problem of overcoming one's own egocentricity. How then shall we overcome self-centeredness? There is only one way. We must die to the self. We must die to the lesser self that the greater self may live. St. Paul said, For me to die is gain, and again, put off the old man and put on the new man, which is Christ. What did he mean? What did Jesus mean by losing life to find it? He meant that we were to free ourselves mentally from the idea that we are separate from God. Dying to self does not mean freeing ourselves from the individual or body, but freeing ourselves from the idea of ourselves as separate from God. It is the idea or belief in separation that is to die, become an active, and not the individual. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We are free from the personal self when we are convinced that we are not separate from God, but one with Him. When we are free from the delusion of separation, then we are free from all the ills of the flesh. The law of provision, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
This means to expand your consciousness in every direction until it includes everything good. Expand it to include your body, your affairs, and everything in your world. Seek ye first his kingdom means to increase your capacity for God. Center yourself in the consciousness of his presence. Look to him, trust him, have faith in him as a source of all your good. Let his spirit guide you in all that you do and say, and everything you need will come to you. You will become a magnet for everything good because you have related yourself constructively to your source. God is everywhere evenly present. Realize this, and he will fill every part of your world with his perfection. Let his consciousness fill your body, and all sickness will vanish before it. Let it fill your mind, and all trouble will disappear from your world. Let him have full charge of your consciousness, and he will arrange everything for the best, for your highest good. The entrance to the kingdom of God is not through the portals of death, but through the gates of consciousness, wisdom, and understanding. You enter it, but not going where physically, but by changing your mind and expanding your consciousness. The kingdom of God is not on Pike's Peak in New York or in New Jersey. It is in your own heart and mind. You are in it when you realize God's presence, and out of it when you think only of self and all the problems and difficulties attached thereto. You may be in the kingdom or outside of it. It all depends upon your mental attitude toward life. If your attitude is harmonious, then, regardless of where you are or what you are doing, you are in the kingdom of God. If your attitude is inharmonious, then you are outside the kingdom. It is clear, for, therefore, that this law has to do with the increase of one's capacity, since God will fill any measure we hold up to him. Then the way to get more is to increase the size of the measure. This is not done by cramming the kingdom of God into a small mind, but by expanding that mind. It is done by taking the largest possible view of everything, by living in tune with the limitless, and by harmonizing our thought with God's thought. When the outer man declares that you cannot do a certain thing, then respond by saying, The kingdom of God is within me, therefore I can do anything I need to do. The Law of Choice Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus' statement in a parable that a certain man had two sons points out the possibility of experiencing both good and evil. Moses revealed the same thing when he told the children of Israel that he had set before them a blessing and a curse, and that they must choose whom they would serve. Just as there are two ways of looking at the things that happen to us, so there are two ways of looking at life. One brings health, happiness, and success, while the other brings sickness, misery, and failure. There is just one power, and the way we relate ourselves to it is what counts. If we relate ourselves to it destructively, then the power will be misdirected. It then will not go where it is supposed to go, and evil conditions will be created. If we are related to it constructively, then it will be directed into constructive channels and will create good conditions. Thus it is evident that the way to overcome evil is by choosing the good, by removing false ideas and creating true ideas. Evil will then disappear in the exact proportion that we cease to believe in it, while good will come to us in the precise degree that we embody it. When we stop the dual act of believing both in the presence and the absence of God, and turn with our whole being to the one, then evil will be swallowed up in the good. I will forgive their inequity, and I will remember their sin no more. That is, our sin will be wiped out completely, it will cease to exist. Live constantly in the inner conviction that God is the only presence and power in your life, never compromising with anything less than the fullness of God, and you soon will discover that something is happening in your life that never happened before. Do not try to make things happen. Simply know that they are happening. Daily realize your unity with the whole and the unity of the whole with you. You soon will develop such a powerful personality that all who come in contact with you will wish to remain in your presence. The Law of Prayer Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. This is God's law of prayer. The infinite knows our needs before we ask him. But prayer completes a circuit which opens the mind to receive. The Steps in Prayer 1. Balance your mind. Before God can fill our emptiness with his fullness, we must have a consciousness of oneness, order, and completeness. To get a larger measure of his good, we must remove everything that you would deny that good. We must purify our minds of all that is at variance with his will. The man who comes to God with a large capacity or receptivity will receive a large gift. The man who comes with a small measure will receive a small gift. Since all things are yours, said St. Paul, then our measure of God's blessings always will be as large as our conscious realization of those blessings. It does not make any difference how large the measure may be. It will be filled. 
Do you understand what that means? It means that there is no limit to what God can and will do for you when you have his mind and you have his mind when your own mind is divested of all thought of self. The first step in prayer then is to purify the mind, to neutralize all false beliefs, to drop the negations and to counteract every acid thought. Why is this necessary? Because the cleansing of consciousness puts us in a right psychological and metaphysical position toward God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Before man buys an automobile, he makes a place for it by providing a garage. Before a man receives a new blessing from God, he must make a place for it in his mind. He must get rid of everything that would in any way contradict, oppose, or deny its presence. That is why St. James told us to confess our faults. We must remove and erase completely all old mistakes. We must forgive ourselves and everybody. We must forgive all problems, troubles, difficulties, worries, fears, and injustice. We must let go completely and wipe them out altogether. We must not hold on to anything that would in any way dim the brilliance of that which is to heal and make us whole. 2. Relax the mind. The second step is to relax the mind. Just as the sky cannot be reflected on troubled waters, so the presence of God cannot be felt by a restless soul. Be still and know that I am God. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Be silent, all flesh, before Jehovah. My soul, wait thou in silence for God only, for my expectation is from him. When we realize that in quietness and in confidence is the only way we can get to God and the only way he can get to us, then we should be meticulous in our obedience to the laws of silence. The silence always is there waiting for us to enter into it. It is the Christ, center in the midst of our being. It is the holy place of God, active at the heart of all creation. When you enter there, you are one with the power of God. He talks with you and you talk with him. You listen to him and he listens to you. Automatically, you close the doors of your mind to all wretched, weak thoughts and distressing conditions in the outer world. You drop all negation, limited, puny, and destructive thoughts and fill your mind with God's flawless and undeviating perfection and make claim to it as your own. You subvert and transcend everything that might contradict your wholeness and perfection in him. Silence is another name for practicing the presence of God. It is a cooperative endeavor which not only establishes more firmly your contact with God, but brings the best out of the universe and best out of you. It brings the inner self to the surface and into the presence of God. It is that condition in which you can speak the word that shall not return unto you void. 3. Decide what you want. Before the thing asked for can be produced in your experience, it first must be created in your mind. You must have it as a mental equivalent. All things whatsoever ye ask in prayer must start in the realm of cause or consciousness before they can become an effect on the material plane. To materialize a desire, you must not only ask, believe, and have faith, but you need to maintain with confidence your image, hold on to it in the higher consciousness. In other words, you must cooperate actively with the thing you have asked for, and there will be no successful progress in your prayer. You must know that God is omnipresent in every circumstance, waiting only for your acknowledgement and claim. 4. Ask for what you want. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. If you cannot believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The act of asking God for some blessing immediately sets into operation the creative power which has produced the whole universe. It not only clarifies and defines the object of your desire, but puts it in the best possible position to be acted upon by the creative power of God. Coupled with your faith and belief, it will bring into play the whole force of divine mind in fulfilling your desire. 5. Get a clear realization of the blessing asked for. When you make your mental demand or claim, let the clear realization of the answer form itself in your mind. Stay your mind upon it. Let it occupy a definite place in the center of your consciousness. As St. Paul said, let Christ be formed in you. Let the object of your prayer form in you a consciousness of itself. The reason many people receive unwanted things in their experience is because they allow negative images to form in their mind. 6. Unite your mind with God's mind. To get through prayer the things you desire, your mind and God's mind must be united perfectly in one objective. Your conscious and subconscious minds must be synchronized perfectly. This means that the whole force of your being must be in request or your prayer will fail. You must desire an answer with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and with all your soul. 
Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. Recognize this truth and then take the next step. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The first six words of the Lord's Prayer mean literally, raise your thoughts to God, raise them to heavenly places or places of perfection. 7. Pray in the will of God. Never say, God thought it best not to give me what I asked, but rather, I failed to receive what I asked because of my lack of belief and faith. Since prayer is not a game of chance, but an exact law, then the only thing that can prevent us from receiving from God is a lack of belief and faith. Jesus said we fail because of our ignorance of the correct use of the law. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It is improper, therefore, ever to take the attitude that it may not be God's will for you to have a particular thing. God's will is good will, and he has no choice but to give you good. When you fulfill your conditions of prayer, he always gives you what you ask, and experience teaches what is best for you to have. The evil in your life was not brought by God, but by you because of your opposition to his will. 8. Get a sense of self-mastery. Know that when you pray you are dealing with absoluteness, and therefore you are equal to every occasion. With God all things are possible. There is no disease too terrible, no problem too complex, and no obstacle too great. There is no difficulty too big that you cannot dissipate it by the power of your word, if your union with God is complete. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. In dealing with truth you are dealing with a force that you cannot fool. God is able and will do anything you believe that he can do if you refuse to recognize any concessions or limitations and if you know in your heart that nothing can interfere with your prayer. 9. Write out your prayer. When a new image has been formed in the mind there is a distinct advantage in writing it down. This is done to impress it more deeply upon the subconscious self. Committing it to paper helps it seal in the consciousness to give it depth. As a seed must be planted in the ground before we can reap a harvest, so our prayer must be implanted in the soul or integrated with God before it can be answered. It must reach a point of acceptance and an unqualified and undisputed place of agreement in consciousness. Out of the heart or subconscious mind are the issues of life. The way to materialize a desire scientifically is to keep the thought changed into the new image. We must take it up in meditation daily and recognize that it already is an accomplished fact and experience. We should accept the idea that the desire already is integrated or embodied in God. We should involve the image or object of desire in mind until the creative power accepts it as its own. And we do that by repetition and by belief and acceptance. By putting the object of our desire on paper, we impress it more deeply upon the mind and commit ourselves more fully to its realization. Let us make it final end by declaring, What I have written, I have written. 10. Thank God for the answer. With thanksgiving, Saint, said St. Paul, let your request be made known unto God. The best evidence of our belief that we have received what we ask for when we thank God for the blessing before it appears. The prayer of thanksgiving really is praying three ways at the same time. It is the prayer of recognition, seeing the thing desired in manifestation, realization, accepting it as already an accomplished fact, and revelation, the divine response to our request. It is the practice of the presence of God. First, we mentally choose what we want. We mentally lay hold of the good we desire through recognition. We magnify and expand it through realization and we release it into expression, revelation, through the acknowledgement of thanksgiving. It now is a part of our consciousness. We attract it by virtue of what we are. That is, we demonstrate our consciousness of it, whereas before we demonstrated our unconsciousness of it. Contrary to the belief of many otherwise well-informed people, we do not demonstrate things but only our consciousness of things. We demonstrate our consciousness at all times and never anything else. We do not set a time at which the demonstration is to be made, for there is no time but now. We do not worry and fret when the answer does not come, but simply lift our hearts to God and thank Him every time the desire appears to our thought. This keeps our mind centered in the one activity, which is perfect. Nothing has hindered, nothing can short-circuit it. It always is operating, always working in our behalf. Jesus understood this method of prayer when before there was any tangible evidence of the answer, he said, I thank thee, Father, that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always. 
It was not his words alone that caused the power to come into manifestation, but his belief and faith that that which he had asked the Father for already was his. God, I thank thee, is the full recognition and realization that the thing is taking place here and now. He that hath spirit or inner acceptance hath the sign also. If we know that the power with which we are dealing is principle and not personality, if we know and believe that mind or spirit is the only actor, cause, effect, and substance, intelligence, truth, and power that there is, and if we have a real embodiment of our desire, then we can thank God for the manifestation and be assured of results. 11. Release a desire from personal thought. The last step in scientific prayer is to get the desire out of your hands and into God's hand. Why? Because the natural man or conscious mind receiveth not the things of God. As long as the desire is held tightly in the personal thought, it is impossible for God to do anything about it. It must, as Jesus said, be released. It must be dropped out of the conscious mind and be in complete detachment and forgetfulness. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. If the other conditions of answered prayer have been met, the spirit must now go forth into creation through the law and action. The seed must be dropped into the ground and allowed to rot, and the desire must be freed in the same way. The worry, anxiety, uncertainty, and fear must be taken away. The desire must be allowed to push its roots down into the subconscious mind and push itself up again into the conscious mind. It now is out of our hands, and we must take no more thought about it. When God takes charge, then shall he positively have our answer. Every idea that is planted, integrated into the subconscious mind, will produce an effort exactly like its cause. These laws were not given for our punishment, but for our advancement. If we conform to them, they will bless us. If we disobey them, they will punish us. As individuals with self-choice, we are perfectly free to disobey them, but we are not free to escape the consequence of disobedience. Laws by and of themselves are impersonal and inflexible. They work the way we use them. They relate themselves to us the way we relate ourselves to them. They never make any allowances for mistakes, nor do they ever work contrary to their own nature. No one has ever broken the laws of God, but many have hurt themselves in trying to do so. The same laws that give to us when we obey them take away from us when we disobey. Let us therefore conform to the laws which God has ordained, that through them we may be brought again to the kingdom of heaven, where all our desires are fulfilled. The important thing in working with spiritual law is a recognition that the good that we seek already is in manifestation, and that we are in reality not demonstrating anything, but waking up to that which already is demonstrated. The statement in the parable that he divided unto them his living also implies that there was an abundance in the father's house and that the son recognized it instinctively.